Well, hello. <laughs> Good morning. I think that was supposed to be part of the announcements or something like that, but we got it figured out. Welcome to Grace Point Fellowship Church. How are you this morning? Well, all right. We're blessed. You know what? And it's okay. Some of us, I thought about this. Sometimes we come to church, we show up, and the first person to greet you up on the stage goes, how are you doing today? And you're like, I'm coming to church because I need it, you know, if you're being honest. So there are moments when you walk in here, you're just, you're just feeling filled with joy and ready to go. And there's moments when you come in here, and I don't have to tell you about it, where you just drag yourself in the door. Thankfully, Jesus is here for both of those moments. Amen. He's here for both of those moments, and he will take us just as we are. And so uh, before we get to announcements, I want to read something to you just to kind of get our hearts and minds, because announcements are even part of worship. Announcements are just a part of worship. It's how we connect with one another and serve. But um, to get our eyes kind of on who it is that we're thinking about this morning, and it's a story in Matthew, and it says, uh, Six days later, Jesus took Peter and two brothers, James and John, and he led them up to a high mountain to be alone. And... As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. And suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. And Peter said, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here with you. I'll make us shelters and memorials and one for you and one for you and one for you and we can stay here forever. But that wasn't the point of this moment. Even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my Dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. And the disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. That's the Jesus we worship. That's the Jesus we worship. When he comes back, he's, he's going to come back shining like the sun. Amen. So as we just even focus on announcements and the things, I want you to not let go of that picture this morning of the God that we serve and the Jesus we get to see, even through all of the things that we do in this service. Amen. So Brother Trey, would you come up and share with us what's going on with the church? Good morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. Kind of hard to read this with these aircraft landing lights in my face. Let's see how Brother Gary does this every day. Is that better? Okay. Well, welcome, Grace Point family. We are blessed to have you all here this morning. And the visitors, we're equally as blessed to have you all here. We uh, sure are glad to see you all. We would uh, appreciate you all doing us a favor, visitors. Uh, by filling out the visitor slip, you can find it in your bulletin and place it in the green box at the back by the door. Eat it. How about that? Is that better? <laughs> Welcome. Bill Taylor's got you over here. <laughs> All right. Uh, down to Breaking Strongholds premiere. Episode one of this new series is premiering on October the 9th at 7 p.m. Uh, you can see your bulletin for ticket information. Many of the cast will be present. Cupcake Wars, the ladies' events, will be Tuesday, October the 20th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, sign up. These will be taken to the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office to show our appreciation for all that they do. Christmas, uh, Operation Christmas Child, it's time to start collecting items for your shoebox. These will go around the world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with children and their families. Pick up your box and info at the welcome desk in the back corner, right over there. Trail Life, this is the Christian version of the Boy Scouts of America. The open house will be Thursday, October 15th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Is that, that 8.30 p.m.? I'm assuming it is. Okay. It also includes the American Heritage Girls uh, handouts are located at the back at the auditorium, as well as representatives. They can be, they're marked in the green shirts that say Trail Life and uh, to answer any of your questions. Uh, place your sign-ups and visitor slips in the green boxes at the exits. That would be over on the east side and the south side. And that's it. Back to you, Nathan. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Hey, would you stand up with us as we pray and uh, just enter into seeking a time of worship? Oh, Lord God, we just think of you. And we want to think of you as you are, not less than you are, Lord, but just as you are. You're holy. You're good. And you're our Savior. You provided us a firm foundation to live our life on, Lord. So as we sing, would you lift our hearts to you, and would you receive our praise? Amen, church. Amen. How firm the foundation he saved.
alegra come before you this morning and we are grateful for who you are and what you've done on the cross. Would you receive our praise, Lord? You may be seated. This is going to be our prayer song. If you filled out a prayer request, you can just hand it out to the side aisles here in our deacons and those coming around to collect it. And you can sing this song with us as we focus on him. See him there the great I am, a crown of thorns upon his head. The Father's heart display for us. Oh God, we thank you for the cross. Lift it up. Calvary's hill, we curse your name, and even still, you bore our shame and paid the cost. Oh God, we thank you for the cross. Behold. You will reign forevermore. The victory. 
request that our personnel search committee would y'all come forward as we pray together for our, our church if you're on our personnel and search committee would you go ahead and come forward and join us at the prayer and I'm just going to ask would you focus this morning for those that we need amen you're welcome to join us here at the altar for prayer as well as we kneel and lift up these requests to the Lord so if you would join us in prayer amen Father, we're thankful for the blessing of being in your house today. Amen. Hmm. We are so thankful, Lord, that you are God over all. We bless your name. We thank you, Father, for answered prayers. Amen. Thank you for your guiding words for your Bible, Father. Would you open our ears, Lord, that we would hear your instruction and follow your instruction help us all Lord to focus on you heal us Father so that we can follow your way we lift up the unspoken request this morning Father if you have a need this morning know this God wants to hear it. God wants you to release it to him. And he wants to help. Would you just ask him now, believing 
His word says, whatever you ask believing in his name, it's done. Father, we pray with Sydney for her daddy's foot to heal. For Mary Pazisky, Lord, for healing, for strength. For Marvin Russell, Lord, who's had three surgeries, but he's finally doing better. Father, we pray that as he's being moved to rehab, that his strength would grow. We pray for Leonard Price, who had emergency heart surgery last night. For Jennifer, whose cancer has returned. Thank you, Father, for these prayers for Pastor Gary. Thank you, Father, for the strength that I get from all the prayer, the kinship and the friendship, Lord, that we share in you. Father, we pray for Madeline and Jordan as they are prepared to be married next week. We lift them up to you that they would be seeking your heart in all things. We know, Father, that they're excited about this union. Would you bless them as they seek you in all things. We pray for the family as they prepare and help them. Father, we pray for peace and healing for our nation. Amen. We pray for wisdom. We pray for your guidance, for your help. And especially this prayer, Father, as they are seeking wisdom as they search for a new home. We pray for our military that are being deplored, be, being deployed. And Father, unfortunately, for many who treat them wrongly. So we ask you, God, for your grace and strength and help and protection for every one of them. We pray for our police. Thank you so much, Lord, for officers that look to protect. Bless their hearts, Father, and protect their bodies and their homes and their spirits. They do a most difficult job. Help them, Father. We pray for our firefighters, all of our first responders. And we pray for our president and the first lady, Lord, as they are battling the COVID. And we ask, God, would you bring them back quickly? Would you bring them back stronger than before? And, Lord, that this somehow would even turn into a blessing for them. We pray for the upcoming election. We pray, Lord, that the efforts of the enemy to thwart a fair election would be spoiled and that an honest and fair election would be brought about. We pray, Father, for those that you would be bringing to our church as ministers. We know that you have in your heart and mind already the one that you would bring to be the minister to our youth, an associate pastor. And we ask, Father, for your blessings on your church as a whole. This one and many others. Father, we pray for the churches that surround us, our sisters in Christ. Would you bless them as they are preaching your word? And we pray, Father, that as they are sharing your word and looking for your spirit, that you have blessed them so, Lord. We just pray that your spirit would overflow. Bless our sister churches, Father. Bless your church here at Grace Point. We ask and pray for these things in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, our living Lord and Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. Isn't God good? Our Father is so wonderful. I am so excited today. I, I told my staff earlier in the week, I said, I'm, I'm so excited about the subject of today's message because today I continue in the end time series and today we are talking about the second 
glorious coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am excited about God's Word. You know, there are four pivotal events in the history of mankind, four events that changed everything. It's interesting as we began to look at these quickly that every one of these four events is a part of the titanic conflict between God and Satan for the devotion of mankind. Every one of them. So as we look through there, see with me this battle for the heart and soul of man. The first pivotal event, of course, was the creation and the fall. Now, we know that the fall of mankind came so close behind the creation that you really can't separate them. And yet, we know that the creation and the fall of mankind was pivotal for us. Thank you, Lord, for his creation of man. Amen. The second pivotal event is the worldwide flood. We read about that in Genesis chapter 8, and it was caused by the wickedness of mankind. Man had so turned against God and so turned against God's love that God said, I am going to take out the whole earth and I'm going to start over with this one family. And only eight souls were rescued and God started over with man. The third pivotal event, of course, was Christ's coming. Amen? The first time that he came. The first time that Jesus Christ came, he came in lowly humbleness. He was born in rags. He was born in a stable. He was born to poor people. He was born as a human being after leaving the glory of heaven, and he came and he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins, and he rose again. Folks, that was a pivotal moment for mankind. His sinless life, his death on the cross, and his resurrection, it ended the age of law, and it introduced us to where we are right now, the age of grace, God's grace. It's no wonder that so many songs have been written about the grace of God. Amen? What a difference he's made in our life because his grace made salvation possible for all. And we're going to talk about the fourth pivotal event. The first three have already occurred. The fourth one we're going to talk about this morning hasn't happened yet, and that is the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about this in detail today, and I want you to remember that the rapture and the second coming are different events, or as some people look at it, it's one event that has two phases. But I want you to remember this, when Jesus Christ comes back at the rapture, which we've already talked about, we know he's not going to be touching down on the earth. What does the Bible say about the saints that are on earth and about the souls of men that are going to be rising from the grave? We're going to meet him where? In the air. The feet of Jesus won't touch down at that time. At the rapture, we're going to meet Christ in the air. That is his secret coming. And at the second coming, when Christ actually comes to earth, everybody's going to know it. It's not going to be secret. Everybody's going to see it. Everybody's going to hear it. They will hear the trumpets sounding. They will hear the shouts of the angels. And he's going to lay open the skies. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 calls it his glorious appearing. Now, we're going to read a bunch of Scripture in just a moment. But before we do, I want to talk very quickly about the differences between these two events. They are coming. They're going to be, you know, we don't know if it's going to be three and a half years apart, if it's going to be seven years apart. The important thing is that there's going to be separation between the rapture and the second coming of Christ by the great tribulation. This we know. There are many differences between the rapture and the glorious appearing. And so we know that God's Word tells us they are indeed two different events. Recap them with me real quick. First of all, we know that when Christ comes back in the rapture, there are going to be no signs. Nothing's going to be showing in the sky. There's not going to be an announcement. He's going to come back, as the Scripture says, like a thief in the night. At the second coming, there will be many signs. We're going to talk about some of those today. When he comes in the rapture, 
it's going to be a time of joy for those who are leaving. When he comes back at the second coming, it's going to be a time of mourning and judgment on the earth. When he comes in the rapture, he's going to take us and we're going to be going somewhere. Where are we going? To the Father's house. Deacons, could y'all help me rev these people up? I said when he comes back, he's taking us somewhere. He's taking us to his house, to God's home, to heaven, to glory. And I'm going to tell you, if you can't get excited about that, something's wrong. He's going to take us to his home. Dear friends, when he comes back in the second coming, he's not going to be taking us out because we're going to be coming back with him. And he's going to be establishing his kingdom on earth, that millennial reign. When he comes in the rapture, there's absolutely no mention of Satan. But when he comes back at the second coming, at the glorious appearing, Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years. Scripture says that when he comes back that, at the rapture, it's secret, only we see him. But when he comes back in the glorious appearing, everybody's going to see him. As we said before, we're going to meet him in the air at the rapture, and when he comes back, he's going to touch down on the Mount of Olives. We know that the rapture precedes the great tribulation. And we know this, that when he returns, Scripture says it follows the great tribulation. Dear people, at the second coming, which we're going to call the glorious appearing of Christ, the hopes and the dreams of all true believers from Adam all the way to those that are brought to him in the great tribulation is going to be completed with a shout from heaven and God's people are going to be together forevermore. Words are just inadequate to describe this magnificent event. But I'm going to try. Amen? <laughs> kind of like that old preacher who was just barely getting by and he went to a revival and he thought, well, maybe I'll, uh, they'll give me a little love offering. Well, at the end of the week, the, the pastor of the church uh, said, well, pastor, we're so glad you're here. He said, uh, he said, I know there's no way that we can ever repay you being here. And the pastor was saying, the visiting pastor said, but try, but try. Dear friend, we're going to try. We're going to try this morning to talk about how we can fully appreciate the magnificent event of the return of our Christ to this earth, to get as full a picture as we can of what's going to happen. And to do that, we're going to go to the Word of God because God's Word is where you go to get the truth. Amen? We are going to be, now, something I've never done before. We are going to be combining a number of different scriptures, at least a dozen passages of God's Word, literally from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from the beginning to the end. And what I'm going to try to do is to get a glimpse of the events that are going to happen at the second glorious coming of Christ by doing this. We've separated some verses. You're going to see the same verse mentioned several times, but it's going to be different pieces of it through this reading. And what I've tried to do is give you an outline, a, if you will, a chronological order as best I can through a few scriptures. Now listen, we could read all morning and get it better, but I think that we're going to see a compilation that will show us exactly what's going to happen when Christ returns, would you stand together in honor of reading God's Word? And instead of having you turn to a passage, I'm going to ask you to watch it up on the screen. Now, you can indeed go back and read it when you get home. But, folks, as we read this, you're going to see, starting with Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to read literally to the Revelation, we're going to see an order of His coming. So follow with me. Follow with me on the screen. God's Word says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True and in righteousness he judges and makes war. 
and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. The Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And I saw the beast the kings of the earth and their armies. And they gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should not deceive the nations any more till the thousand years were finished. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And all God's people said, I know that was a bit of of a read, but folks, I have not in all my days tried to put together a synopsis of the second coming. And man, what a blessing when you read what is going to be happening. Amen? Amen. This is God's word. And all God's people said, Lord, would you bless the reading of your word and would you be seated? Dear friends, here we are looking at God's word. We've read this compilation, if you will, of a number of different passages of Scripture. I want us now to go back and do a little review, okay? I'm not going to try to cover it in detail with everyone because it's just uh, your backs couldn't stand it. So what I'm going to do is try to give you all your heart can stand this morning, and we're going to review a few aspects of the glorious coming of our Lord, the events of the glorious coming of of our Lord. First and foremost, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 29, it says that it happens immediately after the what? The tribulation. After the great tribulation, the pouring out of the bowls and the vials and all the difficult things, Christ is going to come. We know the rapture occurred before the great tribulation, but we know that the second coming when he comes to earth and he comes to judge and he comes to rule and reign on this earth it's going to happen after the tribulation in that same verse it says that there are a lot of cosmic phenomena that are going to occur Matthew 24 29 says the sun is going to be darkened the moon is going to be darkened well of course the moon is going to be darkened because it reflects the sun amen we know this Stars are going to fall from heaven. The powers of heaven will be shaken, it says. Then in verse 30, it says, the sign of his appearing will appear in heaven. Now, how many of you know what the sign of his appearing is? Do you know? I mean, probably, maybe you have a, a little bit of a speculation there. And we do have to speculate just a little bit because nowhere in the Bible does it say, and the sign of his appearing is going to be this so we look back what has God has done anytime you want to know what scripture is saying do you know what you need to look to 
Scripture. If you want to know what Scripture's saying, look to Scripture. You don't look to man. You don't look to each other. When you want to know what God is saying, keep turning back to his word. So where in the word do we have a description of knowing the presence of God? Old Testament. Dear friends, back in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was given a sign of God's presence. Do you remember what it was? It was called the Shekinah. Well, you don't sound very excited. It was called the Shekinah, glory of God. And it was given to the Israelites as his presence. Do you remember? No other nation in all of history was ever given the Shekinah except Israel. And no one else since has ever been given the Shekinah as a sign of God's presence, not even the church. You and I have never seen it. We have experienced maybe the glory of God, but we have not experienced the Shekinah glory of God. It rested over the tabernacle. Do you remember? Whenever they brought the tabernacle and they set it up, it would rest over the tabernacle. And later it dwelt over the temple of Jer in Jerusalem. But because of Israel's sin, the Shekinah glory of God left the nation. Do you remember, remember when they turned their hearts from him, God removed his glory. And then when Jesus Christ, when he came the first time in the flesh, when he came as a mortal man, did he bring a Shekinah glory with him? No. He left that in heaven. He left that with the Father. And Christ Jesus came as an ordinary human being, as best, best way as we can understand it. But because he was fully human, he couldn't bring that Shekinah glory with him. Now, what does that mean? How do we understand this? that he left his glory in heaven. Because you see, he didn't lose his identity. He was and he is and he will always be the son of God. He will always be God. So he did not leave his deity when he left heaven. But what he did leave, listen to me, he left his prerogative of deity in heaven so that he could be fully human he would make all the decisions based on who he was as a human being so that everything he did and everything he understood was from a human perspective although he did not lose his deity that's how he came and was fully God and fully man now you may be going I'm not sure I fully understand that we'll ask him when we get there amen At the second coming, Christ Jesus won't be coming without the Shekinah. Amen? Amen? When he comes back the second time, I believe that that sign in heaven is going to be the Shekinah glory that precedes the God of all, the Lord of Lord, the King of kings. He is going to come back and the Shekinah glory is going to begin to shine out. And then literally as he comes back, he's going to have to break through the Shekinah glory in order to be seen by the people. That, dear friends, I believe is the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. We're going to talk a little more about that when we get down to verse 31. And then Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. As you notice, I'm, I'm skipping around because I kind of want to go in as much a chronological order with the different prophecies. So this is what comes next. The scripture says that when the Shekinah glory is shown out and Christ comes down and comes through it, that Christ Jesus is going to appear in heaven and heaven is going to open and Christ Jesus is going to appear and he's going to come down on a white horse. And he's going to burst through that Shekinah glory. Amen? Amen? There's going to be no doubt when he comes back because God's word says everybody will see him. Every eye will see. And then the scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 24 verse 30, it says that Christ is going to come not as he did the first time, but this time he's going to come in power and in glory. 
This time he's not going to be humbled. This time he's not going to be silent. This time he will not come as the sheep to be slaughtered. This time he's coming as king of kings. And this time all the world will see the Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture says then that Christ is going to come in power and glory. And how is that? Because when he comes, he's not coming as a babe. He's coming as the righteous warrior. And this time he will be invincible. This time he's going to be all-powerful. This time he's not leaving his prerogative in heaven. This time he's bringing it on his lips. And whatever he speaks, it's going to happen. He will indeed consume all that stand in opposition to him, the Scripture says, and he will bring every person in subjection to him. And at that time, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Mm. This is going to be the first righteous war. This is going to be the very first righteous war in all of mankind. The ability of Jesus Christ to rage righteous war is not only seen in his holy nature, but the Scripture tells us that it's going to be seen in his eyes. And his eyes are going to be like what? Do you remember what it said? It's going to be like a blazing fire. Pure burning, removing the dross. His eyes are going to be like the blazing fire. And the understanding there is that he is going to judge according to truth and all truth. You know, the best judge on earth, that human judge that we could come up with, the very best one, they cannot know all the facts of a given case. You know, they could, uh, they could hear all the testimony. They can hear what people are saying, but they have to rely on what other people tell them. And all they can do is make a judgment based on what they hear. Listen, when Christ comes back, he's not going to have to have a word of testimony from anybody. Those eyes of blazing fire are going to see the truth. He knows the truth, and when he makes a judgment, it's right. There may have been people and there have been people throughout our history that were judged wrongly, were wrongly accused, and some let go who were guilty, but not in that day because God says that he is going to judge in righteousness and truth and everyone there will receive righteous judgment. He's no longer going to be limiting himself by his humanity. When he comes back, He's going to come back in all of his glory. He's going to be the first truly righteous judge. His all-seeing eyes, seeing and revealing the truth. Every word, every deed, every thought, Christ will reveal. And that's why Matthew chapter 24 verse 30 tells us that unbelievers are going to mourn because they are not ready. They will not be ready, and thus they will cry out and mourn. Dear people, don't let this time catch you unprepared. Scripture says that all the unbelievers will see their fate, and they will be destroyed before the righteous judge. Revelation 19 verse 14 then says that Christ is going to be followed by somebody. Somebody's going to be behind him. Somebody's going to be coming with him. And it's going to be the armies of heaven. And the scripture says there in 1914, they too will be on white horses. And I want you to note their their uniform. Look at their uniform in the scriptures. In verse 19, chapter 19, verse 14 of Revelation, it says, They will be dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And what are they coming for? Because it says that they're going to be a part. They come prepared to judge the ungodly. They will stand behind the Lord as he makes his judgment. Now, the armies of heaven are going to consist of a number of different folks. First of all, it's going to consist of the angelic host. Every righteous angel, every angel that stayed with the Lord and it was not cast down is going to be a part of that army of God. Who else is going to be a part of that army of God? The Old Testament saints, those who knew the Lord, they're going to be called upon and brought in. Who else is going to be a part of that? The tribulation saints, 
those who actually do not take the mark and believe in, in Christ during that time is going to be a very difficult thing to happen. But who else is going to be a part of that? Raise your hand. <laughs> We're going to be a part of that. God's church. We're going to be coming with him. I haven't ridden a horse too many times, but I'm looking forward to it. Now, what's their uniform? What did he say their uniform was? Do you remember? White linen, bright and clean, or fine linen, bright and clean. Now, I'm going to tell you, that is the normal and usual garb for all the armies of the world. No. I mean, you're thinking, all right, what is God thinking? What is he thinking putting, putting them in white? Mil military are always dressed in dark clothing. Why? Because of camouflage, because light clothing stands out. The dark clothing blends into the shadows. But also, they're not only dressed because it camouflages better, but they're dressed in dark clothing because white clothes get dirty just like that. Anybody wear your spring dress and it was white and before you even got to church you had something on it? Whatever you do, don't read the newspaper with it on. Amen. Anybody get a newspaper anymore? Mm. Jesus is going to dress his army in an unheard of uniform. It's not going to be the normal and usual. His army is going to be coming in white, on white horses. Why? Why in the world are they dressed in white and fine lemon? Because not one member of his army is going to have to lift a finger. Because Christ is going to do all the work. Christ is going to do all the battle. None of us will do one tiny thing except witness what God is going to do. He is going to bring the spoken word of God. And it's going to proceed from his mouth. It said like the sword from his mouth. And it will devour those who rejected him. The glorious appearing is going to bring about Christ's final enmity of Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophets and unfortunately the millions that they are going to deceive as well. Then Revelation chapter 19 verse 16 tells us what happens next and it says this. It says, on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written. Ready? King of kings. And Lord of Lords. Why is it written on his thigh? Now look, where do you think? On his thigh. Let's just move back to the old western days. What did a cowboy or a gunfighter wear on his thigh? His pistol. Let's go back further. Where did a warrior in Christ's day Wear his sword on his thigh. That name written on his thigh is all he needs to do battle. He doesn't need a sword. He doesn't need a gun. He doesn't need an army. He is king of kings and he is lord of lords. And when he speaks, it will be. Dear friends, understand that a word spoken from Christ Jesus will call every being on earth into subjection to him, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Christ Jesus, the living Lord, will establish in that day and in that moment what he truly is, King and Lord above all. The prophet Zechariah said it best in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. Here's what he said. He said, the Lord will be king over all the earth in that day. The Lord will be the only one, and his name will be the only one. You won't be saying, but. You won't be saying, I'm. You won't be saying, wait. All he'll do is speak, and it'll be done. Zechariah chapter 14 verses 3 through 5 tell us that in that day Christ Jesus is going to stand on the Mount of Olives 
Now listen, I had the blessing of going to uh, Israel a half dozen times. And uh, each time I'm there, when we go to the Mount of Olives, I'm always looking up. Are, are you with me? How, how many of you How many have been there with me? Anybody here been there with me? How many of you have been there at all? Keep your hands up. Let me see your hands. You've been there at all. Here's the thing. When I got there as a pastor, as a leader of the group, I always loved spending quiet time in the garden at the, uh, there where the uh, uh, Mount of Olives is. Always enjoyed it. And they've got a very private place here that you can go and just have some quiet time behind the walls. And even looking through those big, huge olive trees that are there, and you start looking up, I'm thinking, is that clouds? Do I hear a trumpet? Do I hear a shout? And while I'm there, I'm all, I think every time I've been there, I thought, oh, wow, wouldn't it be awesome if it was now? If I was standing right here when he came through, when he came down, but listen to this, wouldn't it be awesome if you could be there when Christ Jesus returns and steps down onto the earth again? You will be. Did you read what we just read? It said that when he comes back, he's bringing the church with him. Because you see, when he comes back, we won't be here to receive him. We're coming back with him. He says that in that army that's behind him, that we come in our linen uniforms, white and clean, that we come on the white horse, and when he comes down and his feet touch this earth again, you will be there if you know him as Lord and Savior. If you don't, Scripture says that if you make it through that tribulation and you still don't know him, you'll be cut down. Mm. All believers from this day will be there. Matthew chapter 24, verse 31. We're going to come back to a little bit of that Shekinah glory thing we were talking about earlier. Matthew chapter 24, verse 31 tells us that the elect. Now, there's a special word there. You're going, oh, well, did he pick that out? Listen, it's there for a reason. He said, the elect will be resurrected and gathered. You remember what he said? His angels are going to go to the four corners of heaven, and they are going to gather up his what? Elect. What in the world does that mean? The elect spoken of in this first dear people has to be a different group than the church. Because where's the church? We just talked about it. Were we standing on the Mount of Olives as Jesus came down? No. Were we scattered among the earth when Jesus returns to touch down on the Mount of Olives? No. Where are we? In the air, following Jesus Christ, coming down with him. So who needs to be gathered up? Not the church. Who is the elect that he's talking about here? The elect that he's talking about here has got to be the nation of Israel. For whom was the shine of glory of God revealed? Who? Who? Israel, for whom was the tabernacle established and the Shekinah glory of God placed over it? Israel. For whom was it established over the temple in Jerusalem? Israel. Hmm. For whom has it been given since? Nobody. So when he breaks through the Shekinah glory, who was that particular sign being given to? Israel. Folks, when he says angels shall gather together his elect, we know it's not the church. We were caught up in the air and we came back with him before the tribulation. You can be sure he's talking about the the nation of Israel here. For another reason as well, because angels have always been connected with Israel. Where did they get their messages from so many times? Where did the prophets get a message from? To whom came and and ministered? Folks, it was ministering angels time and again. 
Angels are never connected with the rapture. They're never connected with the rapture. Because Jesus said in John chapter 14, he says, I, I, I will come again. And I will receive you to myself. So that where I am, there you may be also. Who comes back to get us? The angels? No. Jesus Christ comes back to get us. Jesus himself. And yet he sends the angels to gather up the elect in that day. Oh, man, I wish we had another couple of hours here this morning. Angels are not connected with the rapture, but angels are always connected with Israel. Thus, that conjecture, I believe, is pretty solid. Revelation chapter 20 verse 4 tells us that the tribulation saints and the tribulation martyrs will be resurrected in that time and that they will reign with Christ on this earth for a thousand years. Folks, they won't be taken up to heaven at that time. They're going to rule on this earth in the, in the millennium reign with Christ. They won't be going up to the Father's house yet. There's going to be a millennium reign that it's spoken of way too many times for us to explain it away. So we know this, they will reign with Christ here on this earth for a thousand years. And then the scripture says, as that is getting started, as that is being prepared, Revelation 19:19 19, 19 says that the beast, that Antichrist and his armies will try to confront Jesus Christ. And thus we have the battle that we've heard about all our life. And it's called Armageddon. Wow. Notice it says his armies will confront Jesus. <laughs> Not much of a fight going to happen here, folks. Because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords doesn't even have to draw a sword. Because it is his spoken word. And he'll speak it. And they will be destroyed. You can read about it in Revelation, dear friends. But the scripture says that when they confront him, that immediately they'll be defeated. And that Christ Jesus, chapter 19 of Revelation, verse 20, will cast the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire alive. Verse 21 then says that all of Christ's rejectors will be wiped out from the sword that proceeds from his mouth. Chapter 20, verses 1 through 3 says that Satan will be cast into the bottomless pit and that he'll be sealed. He won't be able to do any damage, make any kind of a fuss until he is brought back out after a thousand years. And then, lest I take you too much further, I'm going to give you a synopsis of chapter 25 of Matthew. It shares with us in Matthew 25 several illustrations about the coming kingdom of Christ. And then he says, Every nation will be brought before him, and he will judge every nation, every being, every soul and he will se separate then the sheep from the goats and he'll tell his people welcome into the kingdom of heaven for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat do you remember I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink I was naked and you clothed me I was a stranger and you took me in and they're going to say we're going to say Lord when did, you, when did this happen? When, did, when were you hungry and we fed you? When were you thirsty and we gave you something to drink? When did we clothe you? When did we take you in as a stranger? And he's going to say, in that you have done this unto the least of these my children. You've done it unto me. Well done, my good and faithful servants. Enter into the joy. Let me say that again. Enter into the joy, enter into the joy of my kingdom. That, dear friends, is going to be 
a day. That, dear friends, is the day. And that, dear friends, is the day that you better be ready. The whole understanding of this teaching that we've been going through, there are so many things that could be argued. Let's talk about them. Let's do our best to understand them. None of us know for sure. When it's not written down here in exact form, we just don't know. We can guess. We can conjecture. We can look at it and go, this is what I think. And when we get there, we can look at each other and go, <laughs> so, you know. But, dear friends, what you cannot miss and what you cannot put aside and what you cannot lay back on is this. God's word says that you must be ready in that day because when it starts, you can't get ready. You've got to be ready. So the most important factor and the most important theological thing that I can think of for you to remember as we talk about end times is, dear friends, be ready. Pray with me. Father, we are so grateful for your word. And all God's people said, Thank you, Father, for your word. God, thank you so much that you've given us a direction that we can see, that we can depend on. And, Lord, we don't know the time, but we know this, it's coming. God, would you help our hearts to be ready? I pray, Lord, again, if there is even one within the sound of my voice that is not made ready, God, that this would be the day that they give their heart and life to you, that they surrender their life to Jesus, that they ask you to be their Lord and Savior, that they give themselves to follow you all the days of their life, and, Father, that they trust you for their salvation. Lord, we know that is the only way into your kingdom. We pray, Lord Jesus, in your mercy and in your love, would you give everyone in the sound of this voice, Lord, the understanding to know that they can be received into Christ. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, dear friends, would you seek Christ? If he were to stand before the world today, which side would you be on? Would you be coming with him through the clouds or would you be viewing him from below? If you were to stand before Christ and he were to say, why should I let you into my heaven? And you had any other answer, any other answer other than, I have placed my full faith and trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. I know that by faith I've received him without a doubt. If you've given any other answer, dear friend, you need to come to him today. You need to receive him as Lord and as Savior. Perhaps God has led you this day to come to him. Oh, come share that with me, won't you? I'm going to ask with our prayer helpers, would you, would you, our prayer counselors, would you just move to the sides? If you need someone to pray with you or pray for you, Hi, I'm Pastor Gary Ladd. It's our hope and our prayer that God's Word has touched your heart today. Perhaps you'd like to ask God for His help in your life right now. Did you know that you can call on God's Holy Spirit to help you through prayer right now, right where you are? If you pray sincerely in faith, the Heavenly Father will hear your prayer. He'll hear your prayer of confession, of forgiveness, and for comfort. If you already know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, but you know that God wants you to be closer to him, to draw you in closer, would you pray right now and ask God to forgive you of your sin and to draw you in close to him to that personal love relationship that God wants you to have? Did you know that God's word tells us in 1 John 1, 9 that if you'll confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins? If you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart or into your life, dear friend, please do that today. He wants to have a personal love relationship with you. He wants to be your Lord and your Savior. If God's Holy Spirit is pulling on your heart right now, this is how you can receive him as your Lord and Savior today. It's really a simple, a very simple process of faith called admit, believe, and confess. 
Admit that you're a sinner and that you need God's help. Believe that Jesus Christ is God's son, that he came to this earth, that he lived his perfect life, that he died on the cross for your sin, and that he rose again so that he might prepare a place for you in heaven. And then the last thing that you need to do is confess. Confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord, the boss of your life, and that he is your Savior. If you'd like to do that right now, you can pray a very simple prayer and invite him into your life. If you would, just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to know you personally. I acknowledge that my sins have separated me from you. Please forgive me of those sins, Lord. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me, to die in my place. And thank you, Father, that he rose again to be my Lord and my Savior. I now ask you to rescue me from my sin, and I place my faith in you alone for forgiveness and for eternal life. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, and you prayed that prayer in faith, believing, then, dear friend, you've begun your spiritual walk with God through Jesus Christ. Please let us know about this, won't you? This is just the beginning, and we'd like to pray with you and for you and to help you to start your process of growing with Jesus Christ. Please contact the church offices of Grace Point at the email that you see right there on your screen. If you'd like to access other sermons or helps, or if you'd like to find out more about Grace Point Ministries, service times, Bible studies, youth or children's activities, please look us up at the website on your screen right now, gpf.church. Thank you for joining us for our worship broadcast today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace.